Welcome back to Hashtag Fish, the channel where we teach the science behind shrimp and fish farming. In this video, I'll talk about how to fill up and prepare the water before stocking your pond with PLs and juveniles. The growth of shrimp is primarily influenced by microbial communities and the ecology of the pond, and only a minor fraction of the biomass that shrimp put on as growth comes from the formulated feed. I have to stress the importance of natural feeding to farm shrimp. Let's have a look at these facts. Shrimp do not stop feeding on the natural productivity, and they eat even more of it when we offer pelleted feeds, being 50 to 80 five percent of what they have in their stomach. We also know that about 50 to 75 percent of the carbon shrimp incorporate in their flesh comes from this natural productivity and not the feed. This is why preparation of the pond water to achieve these ideal microbial communities is so important for our shrimp to grow fast and healthy. Of course, water preparation will depend on what shrimp farming systems you are planning to use. And this has everything to do with farm design, pond size and shape, and the infrastructure available, which will determine what is the carrying capacity of your system. But basically, these days, there are two main current systems in use, the semi-intensive slash intensive systems that are open, meaning that they rely on considerable amounts of water exchange from the middle to the end of the culture cycle, and the super-intensive systems that are closed, meaning that they use smaller line ponds or tanks and a lot of aeration all the time to try to work with zero water exchange or with a very minimal water exchange. So the main difference between water preparation and maintenance of an open and a closed system has to do with the microbial communities that we need to develop and care for to be successful. The majority of the nutrients utilized by shrimp to grow come from these microbial communities and not from the feed. But of course, good quality formulated diet is very important for the shrimp to grow well and healthy. But we have to keep in mind that different than fish, shrimp will only use about 20 to 40% of the nutrients in the feed. The rest will remain in the pond water and in the sediment. And this high load of nutrients will be consumed by the phytoplankton and the bacteria which we need to actively manage. Otherwise, these just keep growing and growing until they crash. And when they crash, our shrimp will crash with them too. One important thing to keep in mind is that the main drivers of water quality in a pond are photosynthesis and respiration. And our ability to control and balance this interaction is the key to the success. In an open system, we have to care for the phytoplankton, where in superintensive systems, we have to care mostly for bacteria. The water preparation is quite different between these systems, and this is why I have to break this topic into two videos, and this is the video part one. Even if all you care about is bioflock systems, which is for part two, you cannot miss this video if you really want to understand more about shrimp biology and culture. So stay tuned and watch to the end. In the open semi-intensive system slash intensive systems, we follow the best as possible what happens in nature with shrimp and we fertilize the ponds in such a way to achieve a healthy community of phytoplankton, which will be followed by a community of zooplankton and a community of benthos. When we reach this ecology in the pond, they are ready to be stocked with PLs, as they will have plenty of natural foods to eat. If you still have doubts, let me show you the difference between a pond that was correctly prepared and a pond in which I was not able to achieve a good natural productivity because this pond got infested by this bivalve. In a pond with good natural productivity, you can see that the oxygen goes up during the day and goes down at night. And the same with pH. Again, this has everything to do with the balance between photosynthesis and respiration. In this pond marked as pink, where this bivalve was sucking out all of the phytoplankton, you don't have that healthy heartbeat in oxygen and pH. So 
There is no algae left for copepods, amphipods, polychaetes, and the consequence is not only the poor growth of the shrimp, as you can see here, but a very bad FCR in comparison to the ponds with good natural productivity. So that pond was always transparent. There are several types of microalgae which can develop in the ponds. The best type of microalgae for crustaceans, you should know by now, are diatoms for a few reasons. They are the richest in lipids such as omega-3 and they are highly digestible to the zooplankton such as copepods and are more stable in oxygen production compared to other types. There are several types of microalgae such as the green microalgae which produce oxygen but are not so nutritious to the zooplankton and the shrimp. And there are other types we want to avoid and delay them coming in the pond as much as possible, such as the blue-green algae, also known as cyanophysia or cyanobacteria, and the dinoflagellates. Both of these are not truly microalgae although they have the photosynthetic capability and they will add oxygen to the pond during the day. But their growth is much harder to control and they add little to no nutritional value to shrimp. And some of them also produce toxins which can kill the shrimp or just give a really bad muddy taste that no one would want to eat the shrimp. So how do we stimulate a good bloom of diatoms and avoid those other nasties? Firstly, it is critical that you have prepared the pond bottom correctly, as I explained in the previous videos. If the pond bottom was left with a lot of sludge, even if it was dried and toasted in the sun, I'm referring here to very high levels of organic matter that were not dealt with, you have the perfect recipe for blue-green algae and dinoflagellates. So you can forget about diatoms altogether. Even if you started with a good diatom bloom in the first or, or second week, these other nasties will take over the pond in the second or third week and you see the color of the water going from golden brown to light green and dark green very quickly. So it's game over. Of course, if your intake water is already green like a thick soup full of algae, which will be mostly blue greens, there is very little you can do unless you treat that water first. This may be a topic for another video. But let's say you prepare the pond bottom correctly and you did supply somewhere between 25 to 200 kilos of a nitrate fertilizer per hectare during preparation. In this case, you will fill up the pond using a good filtration system by either flat screens or socks in your inlet gate down to 500 microns, up to 20 to 30% of the pond volume. So once you reach that volume, you stop for a couple of days to let that nitrate dissolve and the soil bacteria to continue to break down the organic matter and let the sun shine over it. Even with this low water level, you should already start recording oxygen pH levels around sunrise and later in the afternoon. And you should see the oxygen and pH go up like crazy in the end of the day and the water going from transparent to golden yellow. This means you have already reached a good inoculum of algae and you can continue to fill up the pond to about 50 to 65%. Once you reach that level, you will come very early in the morning, preferably of what will be a bright sunny day, and you will fertilize the pond in a very particular way. You will dissolve about 25 kilos per hectare of nitrate uh, fertilizer in a bin. You should get into a kayak or a small boat. Come on, it's fun. And you will spread that dissolved nitrate around the whole surface of the pond like if you were a priest sprinkling holy water in the crowd. This method just works and you get an amazing diatom bloom over the next three days. Besides the oxygen and pH measurements early in the morning and late afternoon, you should also keep monitoring your secchi disc readings between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., so when the sun is at peak. You should uh, strive to have a transparency around 45 to 55 cm in the beginning of the culture cycle. Once you reach this transparency, you can fill up the pond to about 80% of the volume. From here on, you can follow the secchi disc. It will be your best friend. If you, the transparency grow greater than 55 cm a couple of days after you reach that level, 
apply more disulfonitrate over the pond surface early in the morning, but you should now use much less, around 10 to 20 kilos of disulfonitrate per hectare at a time. Always go slow. Do not over fertilize the pond. You don't want the second disc to go below 40 cm early in the cycle. You may ask, can I use another type of fertilizer like urea or a combination of nitrogen fertilizer and a phosphate fertilizer like super triple phosphate? Don't algae also need phosphorus? Well, no, you shouldn't do any of this unless you want blue-green algae to come right after you. Earthen ponds already have more phosphorus than we need and with the correct pond bottom preparation, enough of it will be released back to the water column. So do yourself a favor and forget anything you read or someone told you about you know, expert books. Some of them recommend to fertilize the pond with phosphate fertilizers to until we reach a second disc of 25 cm. These guys, which uh, I respect a lot, they may have never managed a shrimp farm themselves. Doing this is a recipe for disaster. When I was a newbie, I fell into that trap. I followed the books and I hope that you don't. How about molasses, rice brain, manure? Should I use any of this? Isn't the carbon nitrogen ratio so important for the water for shrimp farming? Well, if you are operating an open system primarily based on phytoplankton management, your ponds are not lined and you don't have crazy amounts of paddle wheel aerators or blowers in your pond or tanks. You don't need and you don't want to use any of these in your ponds. Just follow the pond bottom preparation method as mentioned in the previous video and just use nitrate fertilizer as recommended here and you go for gold. If you're still thinking that there are other cheap alternatives uh, than sodium nitrate, uh, you're right, but please don't shoot yourself in the foot. If you calculate what is the percentual cost of these nitrates here to the overall cost of production, once you add in all the costs of feed, labor, electricity, etc., etc., you will find out that it is an insignificant percentage of the overall costs. You really cannot compare it with anything else when you take into account the benefits of having a powerful oxidizer in the ponds such as a nitrate and extended bloom of diatom and zooplankton over the culture cycle which will give your shrimp the best uh, zooplankton quality they can get and a successful crop and use less feed which is the most expensive thing in the ponds. Okay, understood. How about preparing the water for the super intensive system? What about the bioflock systems? Well, this is the topic for our next video, so stay tuned. Thank you a lot, subscribe to hashtag fish and see you in the next video.